Presented by Abu Hasnain Murtaza Khan Produced and distributed by Knowledge, Books and Audio So hoping to be amongst those people who ever treads a path seeking knowledge is treading one of the paths of paradise and everything on the earth and whatever is in the ocean prays for that individual and the Anbiya leave behind they don't leave behind dinar wala dirham they only leave behind al-ilm فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ فَأَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ and whoever takes from the inheritance of ilm has taken a great portion of the way of the Anbiya of taking that knowledge which they have left behind they have left behind they have left behind Probably the greatest ayah inside the Qur'an talking about knowledge Surah Fatir The 35th chapter of the Qur'an, the 28th verse إِنَّمَا يَقْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ غَفُورٌ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحله الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلل فلا حادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beginning this discussion about At-Tawheed the monotheistic belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before we begin this journey with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this journey with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we find that the search or the purpose غَيَةُ الْعِلْمِ or مَقْصَدُ الْعِلْمِ the purpose of knowledge amongst the purposes of seeking knowledge is one to seek the excellence and reward شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ وَأُلُوا الْعِلْمِ قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies to his wahdaniya, to his oneness. So do the malaika, the angels, wa ulul ilm. And the men of understanding and religion. Yarfa'i Allahu alladheena amanu minkum, wa alladheena utu al-ilma darajat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise amongst you those who believe and those who have knowledge. They'll be raised in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ Say those people are not equal, those who know, those who are the juhal, the ignorant ones, and those who have knowledge and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And very indeed those men of understanding are only those who take a heed from this. And likewise we find, Probably the greatest ayah inside the Qur'an talking about knowledge. Surah Fatir, the 35th chapter of the Qur'an, the 28th verse. إِنَّمَا يَقْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ إِنَّ 
The only people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ulama. When Imam Ahmad asked, what is ilm? Qala ilmu khashyatullah. Knowledge is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one individual is sitting in his gathering and some of his ashab, his companions stated that this person doesn't have much ilm, doesn't have much knowledge, doesn't remember much ara'ul fiqhiyya, statements of fiqh, of this imam said this, and his student said this, and the other madhab says this. He doesn't carry much of that. Why do you praise him so much? But he said, verily, he carries thamaratul ilm. He carries the fruits of knowledge. And the fruits of that knowledge is khashyatullah. Is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is visible upon this individual. Is why Imam Ahmad, rahmatullahi alayhi, praised him. So hoping to be amongst those people, whoever treads a path, seeking knowledge, is treading one of the paths of paradise. And everything on the earth and whatever is in the ocean prays for that individual. And the Anbiya leave behind, they don't leave behind dinar wala dirham, they only leave behind al-ilm. فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ فَأَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ And whoever takes from the inheritance of ilm has taken a great portion of the way of the Anbiya of taking that knowledge which they have left behind. And secondly we find to remove ignorance from oneself that many of us are ignorant of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the things that we do and even ignorant in the understanding of Tawheed that the whole teaching of Tawheed is quite simply in a nutshell is to place one's total trust and reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how many times do we fail to place our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when the going gets rough or when things don't go our way and we begin to question the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and begin to question the qadr and the destiny which he has described for us or prescribed upon us like are defined to remove ignorance from other people that other people are ignorant and we need to teach other people what is the correct aqaid the correct belief the correct, correct sunan that everybody needs to do inside their life and the fourth aspect of the search or the quest or the third aspect for talabatul ilm is to defend the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this day and age that we find many people have weird concepts amongst the Muslims let alone the disbelievers towards Islam so there has to be a group of individuals who will use the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to highlight to people what is the correct understanding and hopefully all of us inshallah whether young or old are talabatul ilm are students seeking knowledge kullu ma zidtu ilman zidtu jahlan the more I increased in my knowledge the more I increased in my ignorance there is no individual that can ever state that they have understood the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are only people who are standing at the brink of the ocean and some of us after many years are just stepped into the ocean or placed a foot into the ocean and the ocean of ilm is bahrun wasit is a vast ocean that one cannot even perceive and understand and those people who have experienced the depth of the ocean the more you delve into the ocean the more life you find, the more extractions you find, and the more pearls that you find inside the ocean. That is the parable of Al-Ilm. For on this search we find that there has to be certain adab li talibul ilm wal muta'allim. There has to be certain etiquette that a student has to develop in his or her life that we all need to aspire to. There's no point in learning certain skills people may call you a doctor by profession but you don't know how to treat people or you don't know how to behave and the same thing if you are a person questing for knowledge and trying to rectify your belief and your actions then certain things have to stand out to show that you are amongst those people who are seeking the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a student of knowledge 
should stand out. That is one thing that should be clear. The akhlaq, the character, the behavior, and everything about that individual stands out to show that there is some standing in this person. The way that they conduct themselves is a fine character and behavior for other people to emulate. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among such people. And that's why some of them they wrote, the more you imitate a people, you become like them. We find the opposite, man tashabbaha bi qawmin fa huwa minhum. Whoever imitates a people becomes like them. When people begin to imitate the kuffar, the disbelievers and everything that they do, they become like them. And if you begin to imitate those people who are ulul ilm, then you may not become people of knowledge, but in your imitation and your character you will become very similar to the way that they conduct themselves. We find that the specification of the gathering of knowledge, that to select a time you need to speak to people and to teach people the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you find Abdullah ibn Mas'ud as narrated in Imam Bukhari and the Sahih of Imam Muslim, that he set aside every Thursday to teach the people. And they requested more, but he refused to give them more than that one day. Because he did not want them to feel or become in a state of boredom. So knowledge is not that for some people may perceive that it's always every single day that a person is seeking knowledge. For some people it's like that, it becomes their life, that all day long they are seeking knowledge. But so for some people it has to be a set time that they are dedicated during that set time to gain the knowledge as many of the companions place that time. And like I define from the authority of Ikrima from Ibn Abbas, that he stated, narrate to the people once every week, and if you refuse, then twice. And if you do not, if you do not, then three times is enough. Don't go beyond that in speaking to mankind. Giving them the mawida, giving them an admonition and a reminder. And likewise, you find not to be extremely lengthy in preaching to them. As Imam al khatib al-Baghdadi, as you find in his work, Al-Jami lil al-Rawi, وَأَدَابُ السَّامِعِ The characteristics of the narrator and the characteristic or the adab etiquettes of the listener to be moderate and to use various methodology in teaching to keep people engaged in listening to you. And some of them said use lines of poetry or prose or expression to awaken people and even to question them to keep them stimulated inside the discussion. And knowledge the first thing that we find, many of the ulama who write about ulum al-hadith, they always place this chapter inside there, a rihla tu fi talab al-hadith, a journey to search for hadith, as Imam Baghdadi places this chapter. What does it mean to travel to find a hadith or to find knowledge? Because many people in this day and age feel that knowledge should come to them whether it be the use of the internet, whatever forms of technology that you find, that should be so accessible, it should be easily there for you. And this is an incorrect understanding of what is a rihla fi talab al-hadith. What is the journey of the seeking of knowledge? Ibn Abbas, if you read his seerah and his example, he used to sit outside the door of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ until he came out. He used to sit outside the door and wait for the Prophet Muhammad to come out of the door and seek knowledge from him. So he went to the knowledge. Is the extraction that we learn from this author, or from this author, from this narration, that you have to go to the knowledge to seek it. Imam Malik stated, Rahmatullah alayh, that knowledge is to be come to, it does not come to you. You have to go to knowledge. It doesn't come to you. And the greatest parable is of a well. If you're thirsty, you travel to the well. The well doesn't travel to you. The well never ever moves. And it will never ever move. And that's a perception that we need to understand. That if you want to gain something, you have to travel there. And you have to seek it to gain the benefit from that well. Wherever that well may be. Wherever it's placed, you have to find that well to extract the water from the well. 
And likewise we find the removal of sins. There are some people may be in the journey of talabatul ilm. But yet they're not abstaining from muharramat, from haram things or evil things. And so knowledge is not being developed inside their heart. And these lines of poetry that we find some people dif- differ whether these are words of Imam Shafi'i or whether they're words of Waqi'i. Shakawtu ila Waqi'a su'a hifdi. That I complain to Waqi, who was one of the teachers of Imam Shafi'i. Some people differ whether Waqi was ever a teacher of him. But the lines of poetry fall true. That I complain to him about my bad memory. فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكَ الْمَعَاصِي And he told me to stay away from sins. فَإِنَّ عِلْمَ نُورٌ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُؤْطَى لِعَاصِي Very knowledge is light. And the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never given to a disobedient individual. So sometimes people could be reading masses of works. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ Fear Allah and He will teach you. There's no academic research that a person could just pick up works and read it and gain some development and understanding. This is a science that when you strive to your utmost, that small portions of it may be given to you in his perception of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Mas'ud, he states that learn, learn, so when you have learned, then act upon it. He who goes out for knowledge, then it will not benefit him. He who goes out for knowledge seeking action by it, will benefit him even if he gains a little bit. So he who goes seeking action by that knowledge, even if you come back with one hadith, and you implement that, then you've gained the purpose of knowledge. Likewise, you find the best ilm is that which benefits. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit with the ilm, the one who does not act by it. Nor does he benefit by it, the one who learns it and then leaves it alone. There's also another grave mistake that we find that people will acquire knowledge and then just leave it alone and that is not behind the essence of seeking of knowledge as for adab talibatul ilm or talibul ilm the etiquette or the manners of a student of knowledge is first acting upon the knowledge that they learn to the best of their ability whatever you learn try your best at some stage in your life to implement that upon the student is to learn to behave or imitate the way of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in manners and in impl- implementation of his sunnans and strive his utmost in, in acquiring those manners. So the talib should strive his utmost or her utmost to imitate and develop those actions of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in his or her life. Upon him is to respect the shaykh or whoever he benefits from, for that indeed is a part of acquiring knowledge. And the first evidence of that is Ibn Abbas staying outside the door of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ shows etiquette and behavior towards his teacher and not causing hardship to the teacher in other than a time of the gathering. Many of the ulama, they write this, that in their free time or their private time, or what's known as Waqtul Qaylula, the siesta, the afternoon nap, that a person should know not to go to the teacher that time to check a hadith or ask for them for some explanation. Because possibly that could be the only time that they rest in the day from teaching in the morning, and then they rest at that stage and they return back to teaching in the evening. So many people in their zeal and in their passion, they think that when I go to see someone, I don't find them. I don't know where they are. Is this really a person who's trying to teach people? Yet little did they know that that individual could have been teaching throughout the day and that is the only time that they return back to rest or they have family to tend to and other things that they have to do in their life. But people in their zeal and their passion fail to understand the etiquette that they should employ towards their teachers. Likewise, if I to, to cut out the teacher whilst the teacher is speaking is to wait and then ask your question. Is su'ul adab, is bad manners, that when a person is speaking, that you interrupt the person whilst they're speaking. It's common manners even amongst the British people. And it's against the manners 
of a student unless they are posing a correction of a verse of the Qur'an or a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or any other statement which needs to be corrected. So to interrupt whilst narrating a hadith and even whilst narrating a hadith some of the ulama they write that you should wait until you've heard the complete wording because the wording of the shaykh could be different from the wording that you've memorized. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْقُطْ وَفِي بَعْضِ رَوَايَاتِ يَسْمُطْ So you may have read the hadith in one form and understood it in one form and a shaykh could have memorized it in many other forms or read it in another form and then you rudely interrupt and then you find out that you've made a mistake in interrupting when there is the other narrations. So that also is part of learning of knowledge is to learn to control oneself. Fifthly, to look upon the Shaykh as his father, but obviously in this place he doesn't fall at that. And rather to give him more respect and try to have a good relationship with the Shaykh outside the lessons. The sixth point that we find, the student should not be shy or contain any pride in his heart in asking questions. This is one of the statements that we find. The proof of this is a statement of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that the best women are the women of Ansar. They never felt shy in asking personal questions, whether it be about the menstrual cycle, about relationship, about other things. The women of Ansar, they would pose their questions. And many of the women were taken by surprise that how can these women ask such intimate questions? But because this was to do with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and somebody had to pose these questions. Somebody had to ask these questions and had to gain the answers. So in a time of deen, there is no shyness in seeking a question whereby you may feel that it may be something ashamed to ask. But if it is to correct one's belief and to correct one's behavior, then it applies to everyone that someone should pose that question. And likewise, Imam Mujahid, the student of Ibn, Ibn Abbas, he stated, knowledge will not reach a shy or proud person. The opposite. If you're arrogant, it won't get to you. And if you're shy, it won't come to you as well. And that's why you find that some lines of poetry, Al-ilmu harbun lil al muta'ali Kasayli harbun lil makan al-ali That yani ilm harbun lil al muta'ali Is war for the arrogant young individual. Kasayli harbun lil makan al-ali Like a wave is at war with a high place, with a mountain. The waves of the ocean, when they come up, they're pounding against the mountain. And the same way, an arrogant young individual is at war with knowledge, like the wave is at war with the mountains. The wave can't destroy the mountain, and arrogance can never ever gain you knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what we find in asking questions, twice we find inside the Qur'an, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. And here if you find that the companion was injured in warfare and his head was cut and he asked some of the companions, what should I do? I'm hurt and I need to perform the ghusl, the major ablution. Can I just wipe over my head? They said, no, you have to do it. And so he poured water over his head, cold water, and the water entered his wound, and then he died from that. قَاتَلَهُمُ اللَّهُ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ صلى الله عليه وسلم That they killed him, and may Allah kill them. أَلَا سَأَلُوا Why didn't they ask? When he's present amongst them, why didn't they ask me? And I would have given them the answer. That at this stage, the individual doesn't need to perform it, because it could be some harm placed upon them. And how many times that we have become Darul Fatwa, people of verdicts and religious verdicts, giving them to people and causing people hardship rather than ease. If we are causing people ease, then maybe we could say that's something good you are doing. But even that is incorrect if the ease should not be there in the first place. Likewise, we find Ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki, who died in the year 543, not Ibn Arabi. A Sufi, who Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah declared as a kafir, as a disbeliever. The difference between Ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki, the great Andalusian Shaykh, and that who was known as a Sufi. 
how close the things are to being attained when they are given their due worth and how far from attainment when they are not given their due worth. So ask the scholar, you will be a scholar like him. That even through asking questions, you will learn many fawaid, many benefits. That just sitting there and listening to people asking questions and listening to the answers. Even when you read the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, That when a young man comes and he asks, or the old man comes first and he asks, that can I kiss my wife whilst I'm fasting? And he allows it for him. The young man comes, he poses the same question. And he says, it's not allowed. And they pose that, why do you allow it for him and not allow it for him? And then the answer was given. That the person who is old can control his shahwa, his desire. As for a young man, he has no control. So you find that you learn adab, etiquette, from even listening to the answers of the mufti or the, the answer of the ulama, how they tackle certain individuals and certain people. Likewise, we find etiquette number seven is not to sit inside the sheikh's place. It's su'ul adab. Maybe some people may find that as something extreme, but that is something that some of the ulama have written, not to sit inside the teacher's place. However, there's no harm in sitting close to him. What is the evidence of that? Sitting close to the Sheikh. What is the hadith of that? Hadith Jibreel. Naam Ahsant, mashallah, bismillah. Naam Zakullah khair. That is the hadith that Jibreel alayhi salam came so close to him and sat in front of him and he placed his hands on his thighs or on his knees. And that is the, the evidence to sit close to the teacher. And there's no harm in that. And likewise to have patience in gaining knowledge. مَنْ لَمْ يُتْقِنِ الْعُصُولِ حُرِّمَ الْوُصُولِ Whoever doesn't learn principles, حُرِّمَ الْوُصُولِ will be forbidden from gaining the final end. If you don't learn basic principles of sabr in the journey of ilm, you will never gain the final end. If you give all your attention to knowledge, it is possible that some or small part of knowledge will come to you. You give all of your, your mind, your soul, your body to knowledge, and only a small amount may come back to you. Is how the ulama describe how the talib should be. Hassan al-Basri stated, it used to be the case that a man would seek knowledge and will not remain for long before its effect will be seen in his humility and in his sight and in his hand. There some people you can see it in their behavior and their character, the atharul ilm, the benefits of them seeking knowledge has clearly changed their life, the way that they conduct themselves and the way that they behave. And likewise you find the ninth etiquette which has become the most difficult for most of us is to memorize and revise your work. Number ten, is you should be present before the teacher and wait for the teacher. As for today that we find that nobody wants to wait for anyone. Even if you're waiting, like you said, you should be revising your notes and if not, read Quran. Carry on memorizing Quran while you're waiting until the teacher arrives. And likewise, you find fidgeting around. Ibn Numair and Waqir would get up and leave if they saw people fidgeting around in front of them. So this is an old disease, not a new disease. Imam of Layth, who had his own madhab, stated, You have a greater need for a small amount of good manners than you do for a great deal of knowledge. You have a greater need for a small amount of good manners than you do for a great deal of knowledge. And many people are just worried about acquiring knowledge. And Imam Layth, who had his own madhab, which has expired now, said that you have a more greater need of gaining a small amount of good manners than to worry about gaining such massive amount of al-ilm or of knowledge. As for adab al-shaykh, or the etiquettes of the teacher, which we should all aspire to be one day in our lives, inshallah, ad-dunya mal'una, ملعون ما فيها إلا ذكر الله ما والاه أو عالما أو متعلما أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم ما رواه إمام ترمذي
The dunya is cursed and whatever it contains. Except for the dhikr of Allah and that which is linked to the dhikr of Allah. Or aliman or muta'alliman. Or a scholar or the one who is learning. Apart from that, everything else in this dunya is cursed. So Adabu Shaykh points 1, 2 and 9, they apply to the teacher. As for something else that's specific. If he is present in a gathering, then he should pass any questions to whom he knows is present and more knowledgeable than that individual. If he knows that there is someone sitting there who knows the answer, it should be posed to that individual. What is the evidence of this? What is the evidence that to pose the question to somebody who you know is more knowledgeable than yourself? Naam, هذا هو ذاك الأخير ابن عباس. If you read the Tafsir of Surah Al-Nasr, that you find that you find the famous statement of Umar al-Lu'an that he used to bring Ibn Abbas with him in his gatherings. And so the people said to him, look, we have a ghulam, we have young boys that he brings this young boy to his gathering. Why does he bring this young boy with him all the time? We have young boys, we don't bring them. Keep, why doesn't he keep him at home? So he wanted to teach them a lesson. That Ibn Abbas has a deeper understanding than would you calling him just a ghulam, a young boy. Allahumma allimu ta'wil wa faqtihu fi deen Allah give him the tafsir of the Qur'an and give him deep understanding of the Qur'an. That's how you find the most classical form of tafsir, the tafsir of Ibn Abbas, which has been compiled and put together in two volumes. So he said to the companions around him, what is the meaning of this surah, surah al-Nasr, إِذَا جَاءَ نُصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ What does it mean? So some of them stated that when the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, you should praise him, you should be grateful, you should give shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he turned to Ibn Abbas and he said, what do you say about this verse? He said, all of them are correct. By the way, we understood this verse, or this surah, is the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That now his mission is complete, and now he's going to be lifted, and now he should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so all the companions had to acknowledge that Ibn Abbas had a deeper understanding of this verse. So here, this is the evidence of Umar al I'm referring to Ibn Abbas sitting in the garden that he has a deeper understanding than the rest of the companions. Likewise, you find if you don't know something, to say Allahu A'lam. Nisful ilm. Half of knowledge is to say you don't know. A man came from Baghdad with some narration, say 33 questions, some say 36, some say 38 questions to Imam Malik. And to some 90% of them, or 33 out of 36, he said, La Adri, La A'lam, Wallahu A'lam. The man said, I've come from Baghdad. You are the great Imam Malik of Medina. What do you want me to go back and say to my people? He said, go and say this to them. That Imam Malik doesn't know. Because sometimes we feel that we have to answer everything and know everything. So Imam Malik is saying to him, I don't know. Allah knows best what the answer is. So this is Nisful Ilm. And I can define the opposite that if a person does know, because this is also Kitmanul Ilm, the concealing of knowledge, that if a person knows something, unless they find some, some wisdom in not mentioning that, that source, Musa alayhi salam, when he stated, I am the most learned amongst you. And he had the right to make that statement because he was a Nabi of Allah or he was a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had a right to make that statement, I'm the most learned amongst you. And even though he was rebuked or he was taught a lesson that there could be somebody more knowledgeable than you. Likewise, we find that the teacher has a strong desire to convey the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we find the hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu when he said to him that if one individual becomes guided through you, then that is like a prized commodity of a red she-camel. That, that desire, that raghba, that the teacher should have to teach the people that they may become better people, a better relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and in society as well, to gain that benefit. And likewise to remove the doubts and the innovations that people have. Likewise we find that to attend the majlis clean and purified and smelling good. Imam Malik stated, I like to glorify the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so I do not speak except in a state of purity. 
except, except in a state of wudu. Imam Ahmad was known to wear a white thobe. The hadith is in Abu Dawood. And here I didn't write the checking, but I, as far as my memory, if it serves me correct, was checked by the late Sheikh Nasruddin al-Albani. Wear from your garments those that are white. Wear from your garments those that are white. Is how Imam Ahmad would always wear a white thobe. And to dress well and to look good, then this is not pride. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and likes those things which are beautiful. Pride, al-kibr, batal al-haq wa ghamtu al-nas. Ma rawahu imam muslim. Pride is to reject the truth and to despise and to look down upon people. That's what being arrogant is. To dress well and to look good is not arrogance. Arrogance is when you repel the truth and then you look down upon people. Is unfortunately a great disease that many of us are suffering at the moment. Like how you find the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, that Jibreel alayhi salam, he comes and no, no signs of traveling are upon him. White thobe, clear white thobe. And in the land of the desert you find that your thobe will become filthy and dirty. But he is in a sign of respect and honor, that no signs of travel are upon him. Is another extraction from this hadith to be dressing well and to look good. And like as you find, to begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations and prayers upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and making the appropriate sayings upon all of the ulama and the companions. As you find in the famous hadith that whoever does not send the salah and the salam upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fahuwa bakhil, that an individual is a stingy one. Whoever, whenever he hears his name, does not state sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Likewise, you find that you should prevent people from raising their voice in accordance with the verse, Ya ayu alladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. That you should not raise your voice upon the voice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in today's day and age, it means to raise your voice over the hadith. That if the hadith is being narrated, that a person should not speak in front of the hadith. Like are defined to speak slowly and clearly, as we find in the hadith that you could count his words, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on your fingertips. The way that he would speak, you could count those words on your fingertips. And like as he would repeat everything thrice. Repeat his words three times. There's also some of the etiquettes that the ulama have written down about the way that a teacher should narrate the hadith. As for those of you who want to read more about these etiquettes, you find the works of Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, Ibn Abd al-Bar, Jami' al-Bayan al-Ilm wa Fadlihi, Bakr Abu Zayd, Hilya to Talib al-Ilm, which is probably the only book which has been translated into English, Ibn Rajab's Fadl al-Ilm al-Salaf ala al-Khalaf, likewise, Adab al-Talib al-Imam Shawkani, al-Ajurri, Akhlaq al-Ulama, like as you find Akhlaq Hamlu al-Qur'an, the etiquette of the person who carries the Qur'an, are all some of the works that you can go back and refer to find the etiquette of the student of knowledge and the teacher as well. As for our discussion in the next few weeks, inshallah, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to discuss, is a discussion of tawheed. And we find that we've chosen this book, it's a kitab tawheed a collection by Sheikh Salih bin Fawzan al-Fawzan. Now here the Sheikh decides to use or collect all of the previous works to look at the works, the Qutub of Sheikh Musa bin Taymiyyah, his works on Aqidat al-Wasatiyya, al-Tadamuriyya, al-Hamawiyya, Kitab al-Iman, the works of his student Ibn al-Qayyim, the works of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Fath al-Majid, Sharh, the Kitab al-Tawheed, so many other works that you find based upon the science of Tawheed. And he makes an extraction and makes this fi ibarat in suhula inside an easy form for people to read. Because some of the works of Tawheed, you go and you read them and it becomes very difficult to follow what the Shaykh is trying to highlight. So he's made like a mulakhas, a summary of all of the works and put them together in this small booklet. 
And he highlights that this is al-ilm al-asasi, this is the essence of knowledge and the beginning of knowledge, the study of tawheed. Especially when we find various attacks, at-tayyarat al-munharifa, various deviant attacks that we find of al-ilhad, of atheism, at-tasawwuf, of the Sufis, and likewise al-quburiyah, the people who worship their graves, the Ahlul Bid'ah, the people of innovation, and those who will go against the methodology of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he feels it's very important to teach people the true, authentic creed. And likewise, we want to return back to the teaching of Tawheed. Not to ever, that does not mean that we ever neglected Tawheed. Because no group or individual can be successful if the essence of their da'wah is not Tawheed. That is something that we need to bear in mind. That if people begin to drift away from Tawheed, then it becomes very difficult to liaise with such people. It's quite simple. People may say it's very fine to gather people and get together with people. But when people cannot come on common terms about their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way to pray to Him and the way to dedicate their lives to Him, then it becomes very difficult to have a common ground with such people. And secondly, the reason for teaching of Tawheed, because many people have stated that we have a political agenda. And the da'watuna siyasiya. We have political motives in the things that we want to do and we want to achieve. And this is incorrect. There is no political motive. There is only one motive. That is to invite to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلَ مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise to save us from the fire. Because firqatun najiyah or ta'ifatun mansura, the saved sect or a successful group is that group or that people who hold that classic creed, that creed that will save them from the fire. That they will be protected from ever touching that fire because they hold that classic creed and then they implement it in their life. Is the key of being among such people. And likewise, there are those people who state that we don't know about Tawheed. We don't read the books of Tawheed. To remove that stigma. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much day and night that a person could read works of Tawheed and still feel in need of reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Tawheed is the relationship between oneself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find that a shaykh begins by talking about al inhiraf fi hayat al bashariya How people changed how human beings went away from the belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm sure all of us know the verse inside the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That the whole purpose of creation of human beings and jinn was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقُ I don't want any provision or sustenance from my slaves. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ and I don't want them to feed me. In Allah who are Razaku Dul Kuwatil Mateen. Allah is the provider and He is the strong and the mighty, the possessor of power and might. So for Tawheed is the essence of every single human being. And these people you read their works, they believe that man was polytheistic in his belief. And in the search inside the jungle, he found the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their belief. This is what the philosophers, they write. The man always committed shirk, and then he found the one God. Is against al-Islam. Al-Insan was always muwahid, was always a worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, until al-inhiraf came, until change came, shayateenu al-jinni wal-ins, the devils amongst the human beings, and the jinn came and they began to change 
the belief of mankind or begin to insert things that mankind did not believe in. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِتْرَةَ اللَّهِ فَتْرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ Dedicate your face to the one submissive deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فِتْرَةَ اللَّهِ that is the disposition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَطُرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا Created mankind to recognize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ There is no change in the creation or the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كُلُّ مَوْلُودْ يُولُدْ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةَ Every single child is born upon the natural disposition. Every single child is a Muslim. But his or her parents يُحَوِّدَانُهُ Make him into a Jew or a Christian, or to a fire worshipper. So according to the Qur'an and the Hadith, every single child is a muwahid, is a Muslim, is one who is submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَالْأَصْلُ فِي بَنِي آدَمْ التوحيد. The essence of the children of Adam is to be upon the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ وَمَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ This ummah was one ummah. And then he sent the prophets, Mubashirin wa Mundirin, to give glad tidings and to warn people. And we find that the first person who came to them after Adam alayhi salam is none other than Nuh, who came to teach his people once again to return back to Tawheed. As the Mufassirun that they write, there was Asharatu Qurun. A thousand years from the time of Adam alayhi salam until Nuh alayhi salam that people were muwahidun. People were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then shirk developed inside the ummah. فَاخْتَلَفُوا فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ They differed and then he sent subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets. So some of the ulama of tafsir they write that these ayat which talk about the ummah was one ummah. And then they differed and then he sent the prophets, this is the time. That after a thousand years, then that's when the prophets began to come continuously to remind people about their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا كَانَ النَّاسُ إِلَّا أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا فَاخْتَلَفُوا People were one ummah, one belief, فَاخْتَلَفُوا Then they began to differ. Differ in their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find that even amongst the Arab, that they were upon the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But this cursed individual by the name of Amr ibn al-Luhay al-Khuza'i, who came and he instigated idol worship amongst the Arabs. The Arabs had no knowledge of idol worship and the worship of statues. And he instigated this in the beginning and then the people began to worship al-Awthan, began to worship at tamathil the statues and the idols. And that's how we find that jahl began to spread. That if you read the works of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, that there was ignorance in, the, in Hijaz, in the Arabian Peninsula, that people were even committing grave worship in the noble land. That grave worship was even rampant at that time as well. And you find that these people of ignorance who begin to build things upon their graves and begin to give ta'zim al-awliya begin to give excessive respect to the awliya of Allah awliya who don't even deserve the title of being the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was salihin and the righteous people wa dua ilayhim and to pray towards them and to ask them for certain things is rampant in this Muslim ummah even today and these people, they use the argument, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى The only reason that we worship them is we use them as a way to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the words of the Quraysh. This is the reason why we worship the idols. And that's what some Muslims state today. We go to the graves, we go to the salihin, the dead people, to the awliya. They only take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bring us closer to Him. And that's how we find وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of them believe in Allah, but these people are mushrikun. They are polytheistic in their belief. 
And some of the ulama have gone even to such an extent to highlight that the belief of the Quraysh is far better than the belief of the people of even today. Because the Quraysh used to acknowledge who is their Rabb, who gives you food, who gives you drink, who, gives, who saves you if you are in the ship in the middle of the ocean. Sayaquluna Allah. They will state it is Allah. And when they return back to Allah, back to the land, Faidahum Mushrikun. Then they become polytheistic in their belief once again. But many of our people are Mushrikun from the beginning to the end. Out in the oceans, Ya Ghawth al A'zam, Ya Peer Abdul Qadir Jilani, save me. When they return back to the land, then they praise him once again and they offer services to him. Offer food to him in his name. It's shirk billahi azza wa jal. It's clearly visible that people behave in this manner. That they have even gone beyond the way of the evil Quraysh. And here the Shaykh mentions that even those people who denied wujud rabb who denied the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Fir'aun and the Malahida and the atheists, even the atheists acknowledge that there is a creator. And you find that the atheist was traveling on the plane, and the plane began to move, and then he said, Oh God, save me. <laughs> if you're an atheist, why do you say, Oh God, save me then? So even deep down in their heart, they recognize the Rabb. So when Fir'aun said, فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَىٰ I'm your great almighty Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded or states inside the Qur'an وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوبًا They denied it. But deep down inside their hearts. They were just being arrogant and tyrannical. But inside their hearts, they know that the Rabb is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no such thing as being an atheist. Or you don't believe inside the Creator. وَكُلُّ مَوْجُودٍ لَبُدْ لَهُ مِنْ any mujid, that for everything that is in existence, there has to be something that brought it into existence. So in these next few weeks, we will begin to discuss, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is shirk? What is kufr? What is disbelief? What is nifaq? What is hypocrisy? What is fisq? What is jahl? What is ignorance? What is rebellious behavior? All these terminologies that sometimes that we find, what do they really mean? And how many of us could possibly be carrying out these evil deeds or these evil sins amongst ourselves, amongst our families, amongst our community, and upon this earth at the moment? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all us the tawfiq and ability to understand the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to implement it throughout our life. Hatta nalqahu subhanahu wa ta'ala until the day that we meet him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa antubu ilayk.